everybody, I'm DJ Six Smith. You're watching the Sit Down. Time to talk about a brand new documentary to be of service. Josh Aronson, Greg Kolojacek. Guys, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having us. A couple of New Yorkers here. Good to have you here. Great. So let's talk about the film. Josh, let's start with you. How did this whole thing come together? Because it's it's PTSD, it's talking about vets like Greg. This is a big, meaty topic. Yeah. How did you decide to get into it? Yeah. Well, someone brought me the story, who's the co-producer of the film. Um, Julie Sayers is her name, who's a friend. And she brought me this story and, and talked about how powerful dogs were, service dogs were, in healing veterans, bringing healing qualities to veterans with PTSD. And um, I looked into it. and. Uh, I started to meet vets, I started to read, and I, as, I, as I went deeper into it in my research, uh, I got more and more engaged with it, and I realized how powerful a uh, modality of treatment it was. And I learned that the veterans, um, many, many veterans across the country, were reporting that the VA was not doing enough. Mm. They were over-medicating them. Their therapy in places was good. Greg, in fact, says his therapist was quite good for years at the VA. But we're here in New York City, which has a major VA. Right. And there's thousands of VAs, and a lot of them are not, not doing a great job. And so um, veterans would tell me they'd go for their appointment, and the, vet would be f the, the therapist would be four hours late, or the therapist had moved on, or someone else filled in. So you have to start over again every time. And it's not a, it's not a, a, a good way for treatment. And uh, the problem with meds has been huge. Um, probably the 50 people we interviewed in the film said at one point, at one point they were over-medicated by the, the VA. And one of our experts, who's a psychiatrist and works with trauma victims, has said that he's actually testified against the VA right. in yeah. terms of uh, over-medication. Yeah, that was a really big yeah. moment in the documentary. Yeah. And Greg, for you, you're really open and honest about your PTSD, your struggles since you come home. Val comes into your life and, and really changes things up. What were the biggest changes when she's there? Uh, I mean, off, off the bat, I mean, the, the biggest problem with having PTSD is the isolation mm -hmm. that we put ourselves through. We withdraw mm -hmm. from society, we withdraw from our families, we, we basically just kind of live like hermits, and that was the issue with me. I was totally isolated, uh, you know, my doctors used to speak up about it, and I wouldn't get out of contact with them for, for a month at a time, I wouldn't go to the VA, I was totally withdrawn, just totally, you know, falling off everything, just wouldn't be bothered with anything. And uh, even you know, at certain points towards the end, when it was getting worse, I uh, I would only leave my house for maybe a day or two, going to the VA appointments mm -hmm. only. And on that particular day, I would do food shopping, and that was it. And uh, usually, if there was more than one day in a week, I would need three days in between to recover from the first day mm -hmm. to kind of get up for the next day. And uh, once I got him, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I live on the beach. One of the things was that I wanted to start going back to the beach, which was a big issue for me. And uh, you know, he need he needed uh, he had to be, he have responsibilities. He needed to be walked. So right away, I was out of the house more more. And you know, in the very beginning, I was doing the very minimal, the three walks, whatever that I was doing uh, at the school that he had a schedule. Then all of a sudden, as he got into the neighborhood, he began to ha kind of have his own little rituals and stuff. So a new schedule came about. So this way, I was out walking him a lot. I'm fortunate to have in my community a private dog park mm. with you know nice landscaping and stuff. So I was out for you know about half an hour, two, three times a day, and then uh, ab about a month and a half into it, uh, we have the biggest dog park in New York, uh, freeway dog run in Rockways, and I. I remember going the first time with a hood on, yeah. you know, just to try not to be engaged with anyone, let him. He started getting engaged with the other dogs, people started coming over, and little by little, you know, now we're up to about two hours a day. That's awesome. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. I mean, he eventually he got me through my treatment and, and having him and, you know, to console me, I finally got up to the beach after about a two-year uh -huh. exercise program where I was getting closer and closer and you know he finally got me to the beach so we were on the beach in the morning so between the beach about two hours a day the dog park about two hours a day so that's just enough you know getting me out into the community get engaged with people the people I met in the dog park you know made friends so you know we go out once in a blue moon which I never did mm. so you know so so my social network kind of expanded a little bit that's huge yeah. Do you still need the same time to recover when you go to the beach or you go to the doctor? Oh, park? no, actually, that's the other thing is that, you know, having him is that no longer. The only, the only time I really still need a little bit more, actually, he does that, too, because it's very taxing for sure. both of us. There's a lot of commands involved when we're out in public. You know, people want to engage in people, you know, plus, you know, I have to walk in this way, that way. I have to look ahead of us if there's any 
when I am this um, squirrels and stuff or other dogs I t take tell them to omit them to, to disregard them I have to tell them to kind of you know so there's a lot of commands on him where he has to react one two three it's like a machine gun mm -hmm. kind of a command and then so for him like see right now he's kind of he knows that I'm engaged just with you out here. Yeah. I'm engaged with you so he knows I'm safe mm -hmm. because I'm engaged with you he doesn't have to check in on me so he's gonna take every little moment he can in the day when he's working yeah just to relax yeah, because he has to be on right. his guard all day long. And same for me. When I go back home, I have him, so no longer. The only time is after the VA, usually being out. A little more stressful, because I drive in and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more, but we, then he'll, he'll come over by the couch after we come home, and I'm eating, whatever, and we'll just lay down on the floor for a little while and kind of just, you know, have a little moment. But no longer is that. My normal routine is absolutely just a routine. I come home, he goes his way, I go mm -hmm. my way. In the beginning, it was kind of... As such, a little touch and go there was a little yeah. ride. There was a little both kind of staying with each other, and now it's just gotten to a point that uh, you know I really do not need, for most part, that kind of uh, involvement from him. That's great, Josh. We heard many stories like Greg between the relationship of a dog and a vet. What was most <coughs> surprising to you? What intrigued you the most about that relationship? Like, you know, what was most surprising was how fast the change was in all the vets that I filmed uh, when they got their dog. Because uh, I was told that, um, I, I was planning to film them for over a year. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Greg and I worked together for a year here in New York City. But I saw the change much, much faster. And when I say change, I mean um, a couple of my vets, um, uh, like Greg, were shut-ins, mm -hmm. never went out. Um, we just had flashbacks, just had uh, dealing with the public was too traumatic. And uh, they finally were able to qualify to get a dog. And I filmed them when they got their dog. And just getting there, in some cases, was difficult. Greg drove up to the place he got it in Connecticut. But um, Tom Billings from Montana, mm -hmm. who's, in, who's in the film, had to fly all the way to Florida. Uh, it was very stressful. It took him days to prepare himself. I mean, this is a man who takes, it takes hours for him to prepare himself to take his daughter to school. Right. And it's half a mile down, a quarter of a mile away from his home. So he really was in the throes of PTSD. Well, I went with him to get his dog, and I have to say within a day, I saw smiles on his face that I'd never seen on him before. Mm -hmm. uh, we left and then came back for graduation, and he'd been there two weeks. He was like a different person, wow. and I really mean that. And the, the dog trainer said that that was pretty typical, that that happened pretty typically. Now, I was with Greg a lot more, and I watched, it was more gradual to watch Greg, and Greg has a yeah, outgoing personality, mm -hmm. you know, but I know what's under the surface. I mean, Greg has suffered with a lot of uh, trauma from his uh, his service, and I know this man quite well, my mm -hmm. f my dear friend, and I and I feel for him very much. Uh, so when he got back with Val, I'd have to say, within a month there was real change, and he was able to go out. Uh, it was a little stressful for him, mm -hmm. but he was able to go out. He was more comfortable with people, and as he was describing before, Val got him to interact with people. Mm. Because there's a scene in the film, as you know, where he takes him to the dog park and he lets Val go and Val goes and runs to check out, play with the other dogs, but the other dogs have handlers and owners. Right. So Greg comes over to check on Val and he's forced to interact with people. And, and they're kind and he explained his situation and it sort of led him back into the world of human beings. Is that a fair description? Absolutely, because, because of their compassion and their understanding. That's the biggest thing, the understanding. You know, that's PTSD. So uh, survivors, you know, people that deal with it on a daily basis. We, the one thing is that, I hate to explain myself, mm -hmm. my situation over and over. We, you know, you look at people and they think they're thinking like, why are you like this? You know, why are you different? That's basically what I'm thinking every time somebody looks in my direction. So to have someone kind of to communicate to them in a very small manner and they understanding it and uh, totally embracing you and, and your condition, whatever, and being like, look, no matter if you need something, whatever, if you need to go on this, I was said, sometimes I might pull back, my mm -hmm. dog might be here, but if I'm over in that, on, that, on that bench, you know, I'd appreciate that. I might not be in the best mood, whatever. So people were so accommodating, and that was the best part. That's what really made the transition so easy for me. You know, yeah. you, you know I was going to say, the, the interesting thing about the dogs, I mean, it's this profound thing about the dogs, actually, is how the need to take care of the dog, which you feel the love of the right. dog, and you feel that the dog ne has needs. 
he has to go out. Yeah. You know, he's got to go pee. Absolutely. So you got to take yeah. the dog out. Got to go for a walk. So, yeah. so that's a big deal for for people who never go out. Mm -hmm. So just it opens the door that you have to go out, take him out, be outside, be in nature, and you feel the love of that dog, and it's unconditional. And that unconditional love from the dog is the thing that everyone talks about as the transformative thing, because every veteran who's been in combat comes back with shame, with guilt, with all kinds of memories of things that they wish they hadn't done, try to unsee images that they've seen, and the dog doesn't care about any of it. Right. The dog just, just loves love just loves you. Yeah. So that unconditional love is sort of an introduction and an, a door opening for you to feel the same for the dog, which brings you back to an independent feeling life. Totally. Yeah. You guys are both hitting on something. Just the way that we talk about mental health and PTSD in this country yeah. it definitely needs to shame, it change, and shame is a big part of it. Yeah. And Greg, for you, when you're seeing the other stories, like it's one thing for me to watch and see this consistent theme, but all these other vets are struggling like you were struggling. What was it like watching that? What did that do for you? Well, Josh was kind enough to arrange a private screening for me of the, um, the film mm -hmm. about a month ago, and I was really apprehensive, you know, about seeing it. Uh, I mean, it took a while for me to get into the process of filming it, uh, and but to see it, it was it was kind of a, a big deal for me to see it. And once I began to watch it, and I seen, I knew there were other people involved. It was you know knew the background and all that. But once I started seeing the real stories and you know the real people and expressing themselves, and you know, and it's basically the same thing. It's the same feelings. You know, the, the circumstances might be a little different. The events might be a little different. Mm -hmm. But we all have the same. We, it's the same mold. You know, the emotions, the feelings, the pain. It's all the same for all of us, and you, you feel it, you know, and you, you see it in the other people. And uh, to see the transformation, you know, especially someone like uh, Glenn, I think he has, the, he has the daughter, you know, to see how he was Tom, able, Tom, Tom, Tom. That he was able to, you know, engage and take his daughter to school and to see that progression, and you know, and, and you feel it for them because you feel it for them because you, you you're hopeful for yourself. And a lot of times you feel it for them because you know you know that it's possible. You know it, it shows you that you know it can be done. People in you know, maybe worse circumstances than mine went through worse stuff. Mm -hmm. They're doing it. They they're actually working on it, and they're getting to the point where you know it's they're getting a life worth living again. You know they're actually you know they're not suffering as much. And uh, this is all you really want with PTSD. There's no cure. All you really want. You want to, you want certain ways to assuage it, to cer certain ways to, when it comes, to be able to deal with it and to have something on a daily basis to, like the dog or mm -hmm. your, or reconnecting with your family. Your family is a big part yeah. that you could draw on them now because you were so isolated, you had nothing. Now if you, the dog gets you to the, to the family, everyone else, you have so many more people to draw on and you know pull them into the treatment and that kind of stuff and. That's really what most of the people who were in this movie, they had significant others, which is huge because yeah. loneliness is the biggest part of uh, PTSD that will slay you. But, but you know, in the film, Tom, this man mm -hmm. from Billings, describes PTSD and what it's like in, in the most visceral, painful way. Um, I'll never forget when I was sitting next to the camera and he was talking and he described it when this scene is in the camera, it is in the film, where he'll say it's like uh, being under a lake of frozen ice mm. and the ice is a foot thick and you can see your family on the other side of the ice, but you can bang on the ice as hard as you want, but you can't get through. And this is a man, when he took his daughter to school, and I'm, I went to see him and film him before he got his dog, he couldn't go to the place where all the other parents were because of all the, the congestion of people. He would, when he, would, he would take her to school, drop her off, and then come back four hours later after playing video games the entire time mm -hmm. to distract himself from his memories. He'd come back and he'd be by the, by the fence about you know, 100 yards from all the other people because he couldn't be with people. And his daughter knew to come and find him. And he was just a mess. He was miserable standing there. And that was every day because his wife was at work. Three months after he got his dog, I was back. Only three months. He was standing with the other parents. He was laughing. Mm. He was hugging. His, his, his daughter comes out and gives him a huge hug. You see a smile on him you could have never seen before he got that dog. And that's why I use the word miraculous yeah. when I say that the change that happens with these service dogs and their, their handlers, the, the men and women with PTSD, it's a miraculous change. It's remarkable. And what we're trying to do is to use the film to motivate the VA, motivate Congress to push harder to pass legislation that will mandate that the VA pay for these dogs because they won't pay. Yeah, they're really necessary. Yeah. I mean, your story certainly explains the stories we hear about. 
you know, I'm sure there's guys you've talked to that don't have dogs. You know, what are they doing? Are they still doing medication, therapy? Like, what, the people that don't have dogs, how are they surviving? The thing day? is, uh, what I love about, you know, the Manhattan VA is a huge VA, and I'm, I'm in, in there now maybe three, four times a week, probably, probably uh, eight hours. I go for d different groups and stuff like that. I love bringing them in. I love when people approach me asking about the process of getting them. I'm always very helpful, you know, mm -hmm. trying to tell them about the different organizations that are out there right now. When I was getting him, there was only a few. Now there's a few more. There has to be a little bit of uh, effort that you have to put in the research because there are some, some of them out there that may not be, you know, in it for the, with the, you know, for the right reasons. They may not really care about the veteran as much as, you know, doing the whole business they part They may not train them as well. Right. Yeah, sure. And yeah. that's a very important part because, you know, uh, the VA is now, uh, they just recently actually uh, changed the policy that they, they, because of some issues, they do not allow therapy dogs or emotional support dogs. You can only have service dogs. You're not even allowed to have a uh, service dog in training. So they're, they're a little bit more uh, proactive because of the things. That I've had incidents when people brought dogs in and they went after him. In the, you know, I don't really care. He's a big dog. I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. It's just how it how it interacts with the public, uh, from the notion of what's going on with the service dog. He might look back if he reacts or something. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, I love being an ambassador. He's yeah. an ambassador with me. You know, oh. I talked to the po uh, the VA cops. Taught, kind of told them what to look out for because they're like, you know, we can't really ask. I, I kind of carry cards in my wallet. Any opportunity I get. And it's worth it. I'll tell people about it. You know how. And the thing about it is, there are more and more veterans that are asking, more and more veterans who are eligible that know they're eligible. Mm -hmm. Especially, I spend a lot of time on the second floor, which is the mental health. Yeah. And you know, a lot of more doctors. My, I'm f very familiar with the director of the whole program, Dr. Aiken, who runs the whole clinic. And she was the one who introduced me with the organization. She's very active in telling her providers to engage more with the uh, clients and ask them if th there's a need and to kind of start putting the programs forward a little bit. What do you guys think are the biggest issues for veterans today? I mean, you're obviously in the thick of things. You spend time with veterans. What are the biggest issues we need to tackle here? Well, for me, you know, on an individual basis, it's definitely the PTSD mm -hmm. and, and the isolation. And, you know, we are at that point, we're our worst enemies. The other thing, of course, is the, the state of the healthcare, sure. the VA healthcare, yeah. because you know we'll, we have six VAs around here. We're, they're, they're affiliated with major universities mm -hmm. like NYU and Columbia here in, in, in Manhattan. The other places, I know guys who have to get up two days earlier to get a shuttle to wait in the motel to go to an appointment. You know, that's the thing. That it needs to be a little bit more uh, overhauled to you know add that everyone has similar uh, he uh, healthcare. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is. Um, the notion that you know veterans, v veterans are really their own worst enemies in a lot of ways because veterans we all have a lot of addictions, have mm -hmm. a lot of habits. I, I, I'm sober now. I was an alcoholic and, and a drug addict. When we come back, yeah. a lot of guys come into the VA and they don't get what they want and they leave because mm -hmm. they want painkillers or something like that. And then they go out there and say, "Look, VA sucks because they didn't give me what you want." Right. But the VA will never get you, give you what you want. They'll give you what you need. You just need to stick with it, and it, it is a painful, long process. Yeah. You know, maybe and the it's process, an individual. right? Yeah. Maybe the process should be a little bit, you know, compressed a little bit. But you know, it, it's what we have. We're the only country that have it. We should mm -hmm. be proud of it, and you know, we should take advantage of it. People need to sure. take advantage of it. But it, on top of everything that Greg said, as a as a country and as a government, we have to bring our veterans home in a way and give them all the the, the runway and the instruction to train them to go back into civil, civilian mm -hmm. life. We don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Up till World War II, we weren't bad at it. I mean, in World War II, guys would come back on battleships and they would be there for two weeks and they would be they would circle up and they would tell war stories and they would have uh, commanders would be there and there would be a whole ritual return. And then we had ticker tape parades. It was a different yeah, kind of war, sure, obviously. Sure. But we honored them. And since then, we haven't honored our veterans, our warriors. And so there, there's been a real, real problem. Of course, Vietnam was a horror. It was a stain on us for spitting on them and calling them baby killers. Mm -hmm. These are 19-year-old kids who were drafted and told what to do. Mm -hmm. And they come home and they're spit on. Right. I mean, and it's, it's impacted their lives. 
and Afghanistan and Iraq vets come back and we say, you know, welcome for your service, thank you for your service, but the military um, basically plucks them off the, f the field and 18 hours later deposits them in their hometown in their it's home. Crazy. It's yeah. crazy. So we need the return rituals and we need the instruction for our veterans to bring them back, to teach them. The disconnect in, in that is, uh, you know, I learned first firsthand because of the, uh, the process of uh, leaving the military is that the focus is usually on just skimming over the process of, over the certain things, jobs, uh, funding. You know, there's not really no. We're not trained to come home. Like we train for for combat, we're mm -hmm. not trained to come home. Yeah. And the worst part is that the disconnect between the uh, military budget and the VA budget. The military pushes us out because they're like, we're not going to be spending money on you, training, retraining you to go home and everything else. We'll push you out to the VA. The VA budget will take care of it, and this way we save money. And that's basically what it's about. So there is no, I mean, it, the process of leaving the military is a week-long process. There's, I think there was one workshop, which was like a half-hour workshop of us. Uh, the workshop was about the deferred the process, mm -hmm. not even about anything. Everything it's else, crazy. you just simply, you simply go to four or five different offices, different entities, they stamp your, your form, and you're out. There's no, no it's preparation. Like good luck. Hey, right. you're on your own. Yeah, and the other right. thing is, as you're leaving, if they say to you, I've he I heard this over mm -hmm. and over again, if they say to you, do you have any complaints? Do you have any issues? Do you have oh. any things? <laughs> if you say that you have, you've been diagnosed with PTSD, yeah. your life is a mess from that moment really? on. You're, especially if you're still in the service, because then they won't give you any, you, know, you can't work. Right. Mm -hmm. You can't work. So you, you learn, if you want to get home, you, ha you don't play the game a little bit. You play the game. Yeah. You play the game. Well, That's if you not mentioned good for you. mental yeah. health, any issues of mental health mm -hmm. in, in the military while you're on active duty. Like when I came back, I had really bad nightmares and I couldn't sleep for days mm -hmm. on. And I was, you know, we had to train. I was in charge of a team then. I had men under me and, you know, you can only do it two, three days. After two, three days, you, you start hallucinating and hearing things and, you, you know, your body starts doing some crazy stuff to you and uh, the lack of sleep and everything else I remember I went and asked to, to every barracks at a medical station for every company I went they told me I have to go to uh, the main hospital the main hospital they sent me to a mental health uh, department as soon as I came back to my unit they already knew I was in mental health and they already and fir first thing is like they suspended my command I couldn't be in command of my mm -hmm. man didn't have access to weapons for a month so instead of you know there's no of, trust. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Instead of kind of seeing w what's going on with me, how they could help me on the, on the you know, interior level, which is like I'm with them every day, they, they shun me. Huh. And that's, that's the process nowadays. I yeah. mean, anything with mental health, as soon as you go to mental health, the command finds out and you're done you're for. Done. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. But again, it just represents a much larger right, issue. Right, exactly. How we talk about that's things. right. Definitely. That's right. Well, we are dispensable. You know, that's the thing. It's for every, sure. They're not going to spend money fixing me. They have three more guys coming in. That's right. But yeah, it's a financial thing too, investing in the resources right. to take care of you guys. Yeah. That right. really needs to happen. That's and right. It's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility. There's a quote yeah. in the film that says, from an early general of ours, that says uh, the, 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 uh, what the country will look like in the future will depend on how we take care of our returning soldiers. Mm. That sounds like it's contemporary. It was George Washington. Yeah, that's right. You, you had know? the quote, yeah. And we still have the problem. Unreal. So when people check this film out for both you guys, what do you want them to feel? What do you want them to think about? What are the biggest things to take away? I, you know, I, I'm very happily shocked that a lot of the people that in the public nowadays are so accepting of veterans and everything else. And uh, I'm hoping some of the people that see it, they, they actually see more of the deeper issues that really, you know, they thank us for our service and everything else. But maybe they'll be able to kind of go deeper into the darkness of what PTSD is, what a lot of us suffer from, and uh, how much how much help we need, you know, from the government and on the local levels, and you know, and from public itself. And for me, the bigger picture on top of that, which is vital, is what got them there in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a section towards the end of the film, which is a cost of war section, yeah. where we interview several of the people talking on that subject and, and what they gave up. And what the film really is about, underneath it all, is about what war does to our young people. You know, we send them off to basic training, essentially to teach them to become killers, mm. to teach them to become warriors. And then we send them out into combat, and then we c and then 20% come back from Iraq and uh, Afghanistan with PTSD, with this problem. It's our responsibility. So the question is, when should we send them off to war? When do we need to do it? And the point is, we've had a lot of wars that didn't need to happen. So we should be doing everything we possibly can to avoid conflict. And when a Hitler rises and we have a Holocaust looming, sure, we sure. need a standing army. But boycott, 
diplomacy, everything else we can possibly use before we send men in, into combat. Yeah. Because the result is too painful, too Certainly horrible. Remake and rethink a lot of different things here. No and doubt. we know this story from the beginning of humanity. You know, as of the, the, the history of mm -hmm. PTSD section, which is really the history of this malady that happens in war, it wasn't called PTSD until the 80s. Before that, it was soldier's heart. It was, there's all kinds of names Shell for shock. it. Right. Shell shock. Shell yeah, shock. I mean, you go back to the Bible, it's all the way right. back. Back yeah. to the Bible, it's before the Bible. It's yeah. Gilgamesh, 5,000 right. years ago. So, you know, this is, this is a, a parallel track with humanity. No and doubt. This, this is who we are. Yeah. Well, guys, really nice to meet you. Thank you, Josh. Great. Yeah, thank you Thanks so much. Why don't you tell everybody where they can check it out in New yeah, York, LA? Yeah, 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 please. The film opens in New York at the Cinema Village this Friday, which is November the 1st. It's there for a week. And uh, I'll be there. Greg and I will be there on the 1st at the 7 o'clock show. And uh, I'll be there on the 2nd at the 7 o'clock show. And in Los Angeles at the Lemley Music Hall on Wilshire, it opens on November the 8th for a week. And we'll see you there. Good deal. Check these guys out. Josh, Greg, I'm DJ. See you next time. Go and sit down. Thanks.